This is Goss's Garage with Pat Goss, co-host of PBS's Motor Week. He'll take your calls and comments now at 844-885-4677 or email him at radio at goss-garage.com. And now, Pat Goss. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Goss's Garage. Question for you. Do you know that your best bet in buying a car is buying a used car? How can that be? Well, look at how cars depreciate and suddenly that makes sense. See, cars usually take the biggest hit in depreciation during the first two years of ownership. So, the savings on a one, two, or even three year old car can be huge. By shopping, you may be able to find a two or three year old lightly used car and save up to 50% of what it cost new. So, instead of saving a couple hundred dollars on the new car, you could be saving many thousands and drive the same or significantly better car in the process. But before you go looking for huge savings with only a tiny bit of knowledge, here are some common myths about used cars. Although it is gospel to many, who don't have a clue, buying a used car is not just buying someone else's problems. Perhaps 50 years ago in a different time and economy, there may have been a shred of truth to that. But today, with modern certifications and warranties, it is pure nonsense. Another myth is you should always shop for your car when it's raining. OMG, what insanity. Have you ever noticed how much shinier paint looks in the rain? Have you ever compared how much quieter squeaks and rattles are when it's raining? Have you ever noticed how much more power most cars have when it's raining? Put it all together and buying in the rain makes no sense. Another myth is to hide the fact you have a car to trade until you've reached a final price on the car you're buying. Then, spring the trade on them. Uh, the theory? Well, they will have given you a, a better no-trade deal and will be so surprised you'll have beaten the dealer by hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Come on, do you really think people who handle more money in a day then you earn in two years will be so stupid they will fall for this? Nope, the sucker will be you, not the dealer. Or how about those of you who think you can beat up on the dealer by pulling some mystical number out of the air or your butt, then going to the bank to get a cashier's check or cash in that amount? The plan? Give them the money and they will be so impressed with all that cash that they will accept your asinine offer. I bet you're the type of person who believes there truly is a pot of gold at the end of every rainbow, too. Trying to beat dealers at their own business is not likely to happen. Now, another myth is that modern digital odometers cannot be rolled back. If you believe that one, I have a piece of land to sell you at the ocean. Granted, you can only see it at very low tide, but what the heck, for two hours every few days, it is so beautiful. See, digital electronic odometers are much easier to reset than the old mechanical units. And speaking of odometers, what about Carfax vehicle history reports? Well, they show everything, right? Wrong. A Carfax report is critical, but for every safeguard on any type of data, there are hundreds or thousands of hackers trying to break it. And occasionally, someone figures out how to do it. Drivers don't always report accidents. People without insurance don't always report uh, floods and so on. So uh, if it isn't reported or it's erased from the documents, well, then it technically did not exist. So... Uh, that's what we have there. Okay, uh, we have in the studio with us 
our good friend, Mr. Rick Robinson from American High Performance. Rick, welcome to Gloss's Garage. Morning, Pat. Great to be here. All right. Always a pleasure to have you here. Now, you're going to talk about something a little different today. We are. I'm going to start out uh, highlighting a, a car that we just uh, finished. It's a uh, 2015 uh, Corvette uh, that we put um, one of our most popular Superchargers on. It's a uh, built. Uh, it's a Vortec-based uh, kit built by a company called A and A Corvette out on the West Coast, and it's a really a nice piece. They do an excellent job with it. Um, adds 175 horsepower at the wheel. Uh, so we put this on this Corvette, and uh, it's it's up near 700 horsepower now. And we got a little video of the uh, the dyno to uh, to show you. <laughs> In this one, we also had to look at uh, fuel timing. Fuel timing was critical in uh, getting mm -hmm. the power out of these things. And the amazing thing was uh, we were advancing fuel timing up to a full 360 degrees in order to get that shot in there at the right time to get the full uh, power out of that charge. Uh, it was, uh, they're, they're pretty unique engines and uh, a bigger challenge. It's world. It is. It is uh, constantly changing technology uh, to, uh, to have to keep up with uh, to be able to um, do the kind of, uh, of upgrades that we do to these cars. Okay. Um, you know, this brings up something else that you were uh, mentioning earlier before we went on the air, and that is electrons. Electrons. Um, in fact, I have an example. Uh, you know, it, it almost looks like the the, the twin brother of the uh, Corvette that we just uh, supercharged, uh, but it's an electric Corvette. It's a company right here in Maryland that's taken uh, Z06 Corvettes. It looks like it's probably a, uh, uh, a 2011 or 12 uh, model that they uh, use for their prototype, and ripping everything out of it and putting a, an all-electric uh, powertrain in it. And, and they just uh, topped the, uh, the speed record uh, for a production-based, uh, street-legal uh, electric car at 209 miles an hour in this thing. Hmm. So that's pretty, pretty phenomenal. I don't know what the acceleration, they didn't have any acceleration numbers, uh, but you know, based on our experience uh, with, uh, with other electric cars out there, um, it's, it's probably uh, pretty good as well, and probably will give that uh, that 700 horsepower Corvette will run for its money. You know, the other thing that uh, isn't often talked about on these electric cars is handling, but the battery being so low in the body of the car and being so heavy frequently alters the uh, center of gravity enough that they can, with proper tires and so on, they can actually really handle Absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the, the stock uh, things that we do with cars is, uh, is lower them. Yeah. Not only for uh, handling, but for uh, appearance. So they want, people want to have that low profile. Sure. But what they gain from that is, again, lowering that center of gravity, getting it down uh, below uh, or as close to the, uh, the axle line of the car as you can to uh, minimize the body roll as you go through a turn. In a, in an electric car, you got an anchor down there in the floor mm -hmm. <laughs> that's below the uh, the axle line uh, that uh, really helps stabilize them. Yeah, so there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. It isn't just putting a, an electric motor into a, a vehicle and having it work and work right and so on. Right, and then and the technology, of course, is uh, is entirely different than something that uh, that we in, in our industry, uh, both Mike performance industry and your service industry uh, just aren't uh, up to speed on yet and in, in, in how to uh, handle them. It's going to be a real challenge uh, for us. All right. Rick, hold that thought. 
Folks, we're going to take a quick break. Break. More with Rick Robinson from American High Performance in Morton, Virginia, coming up right here on Goss's Garage. Stay tuned. Pat will take your calls next at 844-885-4677. Goss's Garage continues in a moment. Never drive with a bad attitude. I know that's hard with so many stupid, distracted, aggressive, and just plain rude drivers on the road, but it really is the safe thing to do. I drive a lot, and I used to see reckless, rude, or aggressive drivers maybe uh, once a month. But today, it seems like every other driver is doing something stupid. When it was sporadic, it wasn't so hard to deal with, but now it seems like there's always an idiot three feet from my rear bumper or weaving into my lane or cutting me off. Distracted? Probably. Dangerous? Absolutely. But there's nothing to do except drive defensively and not aggravate other drivers. Much as I'd like to, I don't middle finger the offending driver and definitely don't hit my brakes to scare a tailgater. Initially, these situations may be simple mistakes, but an aggressive response to a mistake can escalate it into a personal confrontation which can easily turn into road rage. Unfortunately, you have no idea which one of these idiots will try to hurt you with their car, a weapon, or their fists. Also, never make direct eye contact with the offending driver. If you're the offender, be courteous and get out of the way. Whether it's a mistake or intentional aggression, remember, back down, yield, let it go. It takes brains to overcome anger. Use your brain. Be smart. Life changes at a ferocious pace these days, especially when it comes to maintaining our cars. For example, automatic transmissions now need regular fluid flushes. Transmission fluid breaks down with use, and although it may look fine, its additives wear out and it can no longer properly protect bands, clutches, seals, and other hugely expensive parts inside your transmission. Bottom line, more wear and a shorter transmission life. Now you can significantly extend transmission life with a BG transmission flush every 24 to 30,000 miles or two years. BG makes the best transmission flush machine I've ever tested. It renews all of the fluid in your transmission, not just a small part of it. The BG transmission flush machine is safe, too, because it uses the natural circulation of the transmission. Your transmission will work better and last longer. As with everything BG offers, this is a superior service. For more information, go to BGProd.com or BGFindAShop.com. This is Goss's Garage with Pat Goss. Call the show now at 844-885-4677. And yes, folks, this portion of Goss's Garage is brought to you by BG Products. Yes, I use them in my own cars. Yes, I sell them in my shop. All right, Rick Robinson, the owner of American High Performance in Morton, Virginia, is here in the studio talking about things a little bit different, uh, some of the aspects of what's happening electrically in today's car market. One of the things that got me thinking about this recently uh, was uh, GM's announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that they intend to move uh, towards an all-electric fleet. fleet. They're going to phase out internal combustion engines. Now, for all of those out there that are LS3 uh, fans and LS7 and LT1 fans, uh, that's just heresy. I mean, how could you uh, stop producing uh, motors that are that good? You know, we've become so much more efficient in making power out of gas uh, internal combustion engines today that it just you can't imagine uh, just phasing them out. Uh, but that's what they say they plan to do. And they, don't, they didn't put a target on that. They didn't put a date on it. Uh, and, it and it probably won't happen in... in you in my lifetime, <laughs> but certainly in my son's lifetime, who's going to inherit our uh, business, uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge for us. Uh, where does our industry go uh, if, uh, if, it, if we do this um, phase shift to an all-electric uh, fleet? Um, what do we do in the performance industry uh, to answer the customer's need for more power? Um, how does it impact your service industry if 
the electric cars are considerably more reliable than the, 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 the gas engine cars. Yeah, these are all very good questions. And the other part of all of this is, you know, for years I've uh, been an instructor both for do-it-yourselfers and technicians and so on. And one of the hardest things that we find here in the shop is for technicians to understand electricity. Uh, you know, a brake pad, you can hold it up, you can feel it, you can measure it, you can look at its general condition, you can tell if it's been overheated and so on. But electricity, it's intangible. They can't see it, they can't feel it. Well, mostly can't feel it, we hope. <laughs> when you feel it, you've done something wrong. <laughs> That's for sure. So, grasping how all of this works is not native to the average gearhead. Right. Mechanics today have no clue what to do with these uh, things. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've had some challenges in, it in your shop already with bringing uh, the Priuses and other cars in there and oh, yeah. trying to figure out you know, not only what's wrong, but how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Well, we have an advantage here because you know, I used to work in electronics, so I have a pretty good handle on uh, how all of this electrical stuff works on the cars. And, I have a couple of my techs that I've trained and, and so on. So we're moderately okay. The problem is, uh, even if you know how a lot of this stuff works, is getting the specs from the manufacturer. Right. Um, with electric motors, uh, the basic theory is you throw more uh, juice at it, more, uh, more voltage, uh, more amps, you'll make more power. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I used to think, uh, because my experience has on, only been with you know, just basic electric motors that we have around the shop, that uh, they were RPM limited, but that's not the case. Um, the, the motor in the Tesla, for example, um, turns uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 16,000 RPM. Um, in order to get the, uh, the torque and the power that they uh, do out of that, one of the things that's, that they uh, have put in the car is a pretty low gear ratio in the uh, differential. It's a 9.71. You know, we go from Whoa. Uh, you know, a, a production car that has you know, about a 3 to 1 differential uh, ratio and uh, you know, thereabouts. Uh, and we put 373 or 410 gears in and we think we're really getting steep. This is 9.71 to, uh, to generate the torque. Uh, and of course, uh, the gears are, are torque multipliers. Um, but then you have, your, uh, have a limitation there, isn't there? And the reason that that thing has to turn 16,000 RPM to get the speed that it does uh, is because it, it has to overcome that uh, really steep gear ratio and the, uh, the differential. Uh, but, you know, again, how do we, how do we train our technicians uh, in the future to, uh, to deal with that? You know, a given electric motor has its limitations. Um, the Tesla motor can put out 16,000 RPM. If I, if I want really high speeds, I'm going to have to crank that up, 20, 30,000 RPM. Is the motor capable of doing that? Uh, there's a certain point where that, uh, that rotating uh, assembly is going to reach its limit and come apart. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we've got to go up to a bigger motor, you know, and then how do we do that? Uh, so it's, it's, it's challenging for us. Now, don't you suspect that maybe Part of what we're going to see are motors that are built for higher RPM and uh, different things like that so that they produce more torque or more RPM or something that we can take the original out and bolt in a new one mm -hmm. uh, that is better suited to high performance. Yeah, I see a, a, a quantum leap in electric motor technology uh, coming in the next decade or so in order to, to do what you're talking about, uh, to be able to generate the kind of uh, power and um, reliability and efficiency out of uh, electric motors to, uh, uh, to perform in this uh, area. I mean, the, the best ones out there today, and uh, Tesla certainly tops that list, um, can do just a little over 200 miles on a uh, on a tank of uh, electricity, and then you have to stop and charge it up. And uh, the rule of thumb, as I understand it, uh, is 
a 10 amp service at 240 volts, and that's another thing for homeowners to think about is you're going to have to have a, a 240 volt uh, circuit in your house. It's substantial amperage in order to charge that car in a reasonable amount of time. But basically, 10 amp service at 240 volts will give you 10 miles of range in an hour. So obviously, a 10 amp circuit is not going to, is going to take a long time to charge that thing up. Um, so let's say a 30 amp uh, service, which is uh, a pretty stout uh, circuit yeah, for, for any like home. Like your, your electric right? dryer. Right. Um, 30 miles uh, in an hour. So it's going to take you three to four hours to, uh, to charge that up with, uh, with that circuit. Um, if I'm going to take the family to uh, Disney World for the weekend, well, that's an 850-mile trip from uh, from here in Washington D.C. That's going to take me probably four charges to get there. Mm -hmm. And even at one of these supercharger stations, you're talking uh, you know, three hours of sitting there waiting for that thing to charge back up. That makes for a long trip. Yeah, <laughs> three hours of sitting, yeah. as opposed to three hours of driving at 70 miles an hour. Yeah. And, and that's about what you're going to get, uh, you know, 200 miles, uh, 70 miles an hour, three hours on the road, and you're done. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to sit for three hours uh, waiting to uh, charge it back up. So effectively, it could double your travel time. Yeah, it, and it, it's going to pretend changes for our entire transportation industry. I think you're going to see a lot of people, uh, you know, go into to planes and trains for long-distance travel because it's, is it practical to be able to uh, drive an electric car from here to uh, California for a, a vacation. Tesla thinks so with their uh, implementation of a substructure for the charging stations and so on, but still in all, no matter how frequent they are along the route, there's still the time element involved. Mm -hmm. yeah, he had a plan at one point to, uh, to do battery swaps. And he, and he designed the car to be able to do that, to uh, drive into a, uh, a service station. Um, you, you drive over a, uh, a well in the, uh, the ground, and uh, this thing opens up and comes up, grabs the battery pack out of your uh, vehicle, uh, drops it down, slaps a new one in, and about 15, 20 minutes, uh, you're back on the road with a full charge again. That's a pretty uh, interesting concept. Yeah, pretty ambitious, too. Yeah. And the other very thing, expensive to uh, implement across the country. Yeah, because, I mean, you're talking about uh, thousands of batteries, and they aren't cheap. But then how would you deal, under that scenario, how would you deal with the, uh, the customer that comes in and has a bad battery? You know, and you give them a brand new, fully charged battery that's in maybe not brand new but in like new condition mm -hmm. and they drive away with like a, big a smile fat on their rat. Face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know your battery pack's going bad so you stop into a Tesla station and get it swapped right. out right for free. <laughs> I, I would hope that they have some provision for uh, testing them before they actually replace them. Um, and it, Again, it just changes across the industry, which, of course, is why it's going to take uh, several decades for this to, uh, to really happen in a large scale. Um, it's what we've talked about with uh, all of the different uh, alternative fuel uh, vehicles. Uh, well, there's, there's not a, a hydrogen station on every uh, corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's not a, a propane t station on every corner. There, there's a lot more of those, but still... You know, you, you got to look for them when you come off the uh, freeway to uh, fuel up your propane car. And you know something uh, that we're seeing a lot of here is we get people in that say, well, I took my car to blankety blank, and it's not a dealer. It's just some hole in the wall or chain store or something. And they tell me I need a new hybrid battery. Well... What a lot of drivers of hybrid cars don't realize is that there's some really sophisticated test equipment that's necessary to test a hybrid battery. It's not like hooking up uh, to a 
lead acid battery for your, your starting battery. Uh, it's much more sophisticated and primarily because there are hundreds of D-cell uh, lithium ion batteries in this battery pack and this tester goes through and tests them either in groups or individuals and so on and then it pinpoints the ones that are bad and uh, you know how that affects the uh, the performance of the vehicle and and so on so it's it's not something that oh yeah you need a new hybrid battery well again and that's the, the the lack of understanding of the uh, technicians that are out there today uh, you know they just don't have the training and uh, in the in the skills to really understand how it works so change it mm -hmm. you know swap the part right we, we do that in in today's cars, right? You get mechanics who, uh, who just are part swappers. Oh yeah, yeah, we, we see that. And uh, it's really disappointing to me because this is a business I've always been proud to be in. And you see what's going on out there and uh, what some of these young guys are learning. And, you know, it's always been my theory that unless you know how something operates, you know it's operational theory and you understand that theory, you cannot effectively test or repair it. All you can do is swap out parts. Yep. So uh, a lot of parts swappers. All right, we'll take another break. More with Rick Robinson from American High Performance right here on Goss's Garage. Operators are standing by to take your call for Pat at 844-885-4677. Boss's Garage continues in a moment. I get lots of air filter questions, and one of the most common deals with why air filters need to be replaced so often. Well, actually, they usually don't, yet many drivers wind up buying a new air filter at every oil change, which is utterly ridiculous. Drivers say techs tell them if they don't buy a new air filter, they'll waste a lot of gas. Maybe that statement comes from ignorance or maybe dishonesty, but either way, you lose. Decades ago, dirty air filters did waste gas, but today, not so much. Cars now use a sensor to measure the air coming through the air filter and computers to mix exactly the right amount of gas to match that air. So even though a dirty air filter reduces airflow into the engine, it doesn't affect gas mileage because the computer is always precisely matching fuel to the incoming air. In other words, a dirty filter means less air and less air means less gas, so there's never an imbalance between air and fuel. Certainly when a filter gets really, really dirty it can cause performance problems, but even then it may not affect gas mileage. So how long do air filters last? Unless you drive in really dusty conditions, air filters usually last 30 to 60,000 miles. Overselling of air filters is an enormous problem, and the best way not to be taken is to learn how to check your own air filter and check it twice a year. I get lots of questions about BG products, many about specific products or services like, is BG 44K really that good, or our BG transmission cooling system and power steering flushes actually necessary? But most popular of all, do I use BG products in my cars? Well, the answer to all of those questions is yes. A regular schedule of BG flushes and chemicals will deliver the longest possible life from all the lubricated and fuel delivery parts on your vehicles. And do I use BG products? You bet I do. I drive nice cars, and I drive a lot. Plus, my live radio and TV shows mean that my cars have to be absolutely reliable. A no-start from dirty fuel injectors or a failed transmission just isn't acceptable in my life. Remember, deposits and dirty fluids ruin expensive parts. For reliability like I demand, visit one of the quality shops that sell BG products and perform BG services. To find a BG professional near you, bgfindashop.com Now, back to Goss's Garage with your host, Pat Goss. Today we're talking to Mr. Rick Robinson from American High Performance in 
Lorton, Virginia. Uh, let's see, we have a uh, question here. Don't know who this is from, but good morning. I'm thinking about buying a 2010 Subaru Forester 2.3 single overhead cam. Do you think there's a reliable, this is a reliable car? Uh, I've read about head gasket problems. Well, yeah, we see a few head gasket problems on the later Subarus, but mostly what we see is oil consumption problems, primarily because of people using the wrong oil or not changing the oil frequently enough and things like that. So before I bought that 10 Subaru, I would certainly get it thoroughly checked out and make sure that the technician knows how to check it for oil consumption issues and so on. Because uh, you might buy something that you really don't like. So, all right, uh, Rick, more about electric cars. What have you got for us? Um, well, of course, our interest uh, at American High Performance is the, in the performance industry and what can we, uh, what does this mean for us in, in the future uh, as we move more and more towards uh, electric uh, power. Um, we talked about uh, you know, the technology and the ability of, of us to keep up with the technology, uh, but then can we do what we do today with internal combustion uh, vehicles uh, with these uh, electric uh, cars? Um, certainly it's going to take a whole new technology, but, uh, but the performance is there. Uh, the Tesla certainly uh, is the epitome of that uh, today in terms of, uh, of cars that are, that are out on the road today, uh, not purpose-built cars. Um, the, uh, the new P100D version of the Tesla is the third fastest car in the world, fastest production car in the world from 0 to 60 miles an hour. 2.2 mm. seconds from 0 to 60 miles an hour. I can remember driving a uh, European rally car. I forget what class it was, but they're banned now. And that was about the uh, speed of it. And it was small, fiberglass, even down to carbon fiber drive shafts and stuff like that. And, I mean, that is neck snapping <laughs> acceleration. It is. The only two uh, that have beat it uh, on the list uh, are the Porsche 918 Spider, which interestingly enough is a hybrid uh, car. It's got a, a V8 motor as well as an electric motor and together they put out eh, close to 900 uh, horsepower uh, which uh, in, in through an all-wheel drive uh, car gives you that, that neck snapping uh, acceleration. But interestingly enough, the, uh, the number one out there, number one car out there is, uh, what would you think? Mm, I have no idea. You Pro might, probably Ferrari or yeah, You might Lambo. think one of those exotic cars. Yeah. Dodge Demon. The oh, okay, Dodge yeah. Demon. With, with the right tires on it, of course. Uh, right. Because tires are, are the big limitation in acceleration for all cars out there. Um, two seconds flat from zero to 60 miles an hour and runs a 9.5 quarter mile, which is, which is a fast quarter mile for any car. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, internal combustion engine still up there on the top, uh, but being challenged every day by these uh, new uh, electric cars. Now, how are they handling traction on something as fast as the uh, Tesla? Now, there's where technology comes in again. Um, you, uh, you have to manage the torque, of course, uh, so that they've got stability control in there. And, uh, and because you're delivering it to all four wheels, uh, and the weight is distributed fairly evenly uh, through the car to, uh, to give you kind of equal uh, footprint on each, uh, on each corner. It, uh, it doesn't seem to have any problems with, uh, with wheel slip. No, I've uh, seen some of them on the street and so on getting squirrely with vets and stuff like that, and you don't see them going up in a cloud of smoke. Right. So they must be doing something <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's the challenge that we have with uh, with all rear wheel drive cars is uh, is trying to keep them uh, straight. Um, interesting point on that uh, 15 Corvette that we put 700 horsepower in. I was out uh, road testing it, uh, headed out on the freeway, 
um, needed to change lanes to move over because the uh, exit was approaching and uh, it, so I had to accelerate ahead of some other uh, traffic. This is an automatic car with that uh, new eight-speed transmission. I punched that thing uh, to, to try <laughs> to change lanes. And, uh, and that's one of the things about new transmissions is uh, they shift incredibly fast. The oh, old, yeah. The old thing about, you know, manual shifters, you could always shift faster. Well, that's, that's not true anymore. These things shift in milliseconds. Now, there's a little bit of a delay as you punch the throttle uh, while the computer or in the transmission thinks about this, and then it shifts. Bang. You know, down two or three gears, uh, depending on how hard you punch the uh, throttle. And, uh, and, of course, when you do that, the RPM goes up, the boost goes up, the power goes up, and, uh, and that thing got real squirrely on me quick. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things we tell our customers is uh, you're going to have to learn to drive this car again. Get that thing out on a lonely road somewhere where you've got some room and there's nobody else around and, and, and start getting the feel of that throttle. Otherwise, it's going to bite you. Uh -huh. Well, that lonely road, is it supposed to have Lots of trees and poles on each side. <laughs> Preferably not. No, nice wide shoulders in case uh, you uh, get too squirrely. Yeah, because uh, that's that's one issue that people don't realize about super high performing cars is you have to learn how to drive them. You do. You know, we at Motor Week we get to drive some pretty exotic stuff, and you don't just go out there and climb in it and. Uh, go hell bent for leather with, with no consequences. I mean, you have to know what you're doing. You have to familiarize yourself with the car and so on. Yeah, yeah there's quite a few of the uh, Hellcats that are in the boneyard today because the uh, the driver was just not prepared for the kind of power that it has. The other thing that I see, and I think people are really off base with it, and it applies to all cars. People talk about buying tires or whatever, and uh, so they try to bring the car up to their desires or abilities. And uh, in the meantime, they're driving it all squirrely and one thing and another. My theory has always been that I learn the limits of my car and I drive a little bit below those limits. Yeah. Both the limits of your car and the limits of yourself you know, well, as, yeah. a, as a driver, too. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, Tony, Tony Stewart's going to have a better ability to uh, step into one of those and go uh, take it out than, uh, than you or I will. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But so many people think that uh, their cars should be able to do just about anything that they think they should be able to do, and that's not the case on cars. Right. You should learn your car and know what the, the car is capable of and limit yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I did as a uh, fighter pilot and, and learning how to, uh, to fly and, and, and fight a jet aircraft like that was you got to go up and test the airplane's limits and your limits mm -hmm. all the time and just see you know, how far can I take this thing and still regain control if I happen to lose it or, or try to take it right to the edge and keep control of it uh, without, uh, without having any serious consequences. Same thing that we do when we take a bunch of these cars to the racetrack. Uh, you know, you don't go out and do a hot lap first lap. You go out there and you learn the track and uh, you learn how you mesh with the car and uh, what your abilities on this particular track are and uh, all of these different things go into it and gradually, uh, lap after lap, if you're doing 20 or 30 laps, you get better and better, but you don't start out best. Right. The wall is very unforgiving of mistakes. <laughs> You've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I haven't had the, uh, the misfortune of doing one of those spectacular things, although they look great on camera. I've always tried to avoid them you know, because uh, the outcome usually is not exactly what I was hoping for. Right. <laughs> um, you know, but back into the electric uh, world, uh, there, 
there are some uh, um, teams out there building cars that have uh, pretty phenomenal uh, performance. Uh, for one thing, uh, the, the Formula uh, Series uh, racing uh, cars uh, have a Formula E now for electric uh, racers. And they're, they're pretty amazing, fast cars. Um, not quite up to the speeds of the uh, of Formula One uh, yet, uh, but approaching that. One of the criticisms I've heard about it, though, is, uh, is sound. And, and that's one of the things that we've always uh, loved about our internal combustion engines. And, and one of the basic changes that we perform on uh, virtually every muscle car that comes in is put a different exhaust on there, make it sound better. We love the way this thing sounds, the way it rumbles. Uh, guys want big cams because they want that lopy uh, rumble uh, there at idle. Electric cars, for the most part, don't make any sound, although the Formula E's, if you ever listen to one of those YouTube videos out there, uh, have this screeching, high-pitched, annoying sound to them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the criticism that I've heard. It just doesn't have the pleasurable sound that uh, the internal combustion engine does. Well, like a Formula One car, that unmistakable wail that they emit is, you know, gives you chills. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, we used to call it the European sound that the, uh, the V12 Ferraris uh, made, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of uh, noise. And uh, some of our uh, smaller displacement, uh, you know, four cam uh, engines uh, have uh, approached that sound uh, here in the U.S. as well. Uh, but uh, it, it's unique and it's one of the things that people really enjoy and it, you're going to have to change your attitude about that in electric cars. Yeah, and that, that I would think that's going to be a hard hurdle to overcome because if you think about it, when you talk about the sound of a car, every miserable, uh, rusted out, beat up, paint peeling Honda and Toyota in the world these days is driven by somebody young. It's got what we call a fart can on it mm -hmm. <laughs> to make it make a sound. And I mean, it's just universal. So maybe one of our basic mods that uh, we're going to uh, stock for uh, electric cars is a set of speakers <laughs> and a stereo system to make it sound however you want it to sound. <laughs> hey, I, I don't doubt that that might be uh, in the works someplace. Uh, absolutely. Because uh, you know, some manufacturers are playing around with exhaust sounds and different sounds inside the car. Like you mentioned, uh, Mustang has the tube that feeds sound from the intake into the, the car. Mm -hmm. and, uh, then you've got things like Honda Odyssey, I mean Odyssey, <laughs> <laughs> that uses noise cancellation through the sound system so that when it goes into three-cylinder mode, you don't get this ugly reverberation through the car. They put in 180-degree out-of-phase uh, sound, and it cancels it out. Interesting. Stuff like that that, you know, it's out there, so it wouldn't surprise me that they'll do something like that. So they're turning the car into a set of uh, Bose uh, noise-canceling uh, earmuffs, huh? Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's... Uh, except when it fails, and then everything is in sync. And when it's in sync, the original problem is twice as bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty annoying. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some uh, electric ventures out there on the uh, in the the high speed world, the uh, the land uh, speed record uh, cars. Um, there's a group out of uh, Ohio State University. It was basically a, a, a senior student science project uh, out of Ohio State University is where he got started. Uh, and they have a, uh, a, an adjunct to the university called the, uh, the Center for Automotive Research. And uh, they got together and decided they wanted to uh, produce an uh, electric car and go set the land speed record for an electric car. Well, they ended up giving, getting some big bucks behind them from a uh, company based in Monaco and uh, Europe uh, called okay. Venturi. Um, and, uh, and they've built a pretty phenomenal car. Uh, the, uh, they very quickly uh, got up to uh, the 300 mile an hour range uh, in the vehicle. Uh, their, their latest <coughs> record set uh, last year was uh, 341. Uh, 
and uh, and they're shooting for uh, 400. Now this thing, it's a beautiful car. It's one of these long aerodynamic streamliners mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, that, that that many uh, land speed vehicles have uh, have adopted. Um, but it's got two 1,500 horsepower electric motors in it. What? And I can't imagine how many batteries it takes to feed those things to, uh, to get that kind of speed. And then I think that's probably one of its limitations. Uh, one of the questions was, well, how come it's only doing 340 if you, you can go back to early internal combustion engines that cracked that number a long time ago? Well, weight is, I'm sure is, uh, is a factor there. I don't know what the car weighs, but it's got to be pretty darn heavy to carry the battery load that it would take to feed those two motors. I can't imagine a 1,500 horsepower electric motor. I mean, I see the size of some of the 20 and 30 horsepower motors that we have around shops and stuff like that on big compressors and so on. Mm -hmm. Those suckers are huge. They are. They are. Um, I, when I was in my early days, I was on an internship with the Ford Motor Company and worked out uh, in the stamping plants for a while in plant engineering. And uh, you see the motors that drive those big stamping yeah. uh, uh, machines. They're huge. Uh, and, they, and they probably didn't generate 1,500 horsepower. Uh, so again, technology is, uh, is driving that. Uh, how do we get a, a motor that will produce that kind of power and turn uh, these things, I, what I understand, are turning uh, upwards of 12, 13,000 RPM. They're shifting them at 10,000 in order to get that speed. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they have to, to start up in, uh, in a lower gear to get it going, and then they shift at 10,000 RPM, somewhere around 200 miles an hour, to uh, to go for the high speed. Uh, and that's been one of their their technical uh, problems: is getting the two axles to shift together. And not tear the thing apart. Uh, wow. So the, the technology to do that is, uh, is pretty challenging. All right, folks, we need to take another break. We'll be right back with Rick Robinson from American High Performance here in Gloss's Garage. Stay tuned. Pat will take your calls next at 844-885-4677. That's 844-885-GOSS. Goss's Garage continues in a moment. Space Saver spare tires sure do look silly, but if you use them properly, they will get you home safely. Now, a common problem with them is low air pressure. Spares are buried in the trunk and no one ever seems to check their pressure. Plus, they typically require much higher pressure than your regular tires. Also, Space Saver spares have limits on how far and how fast you can drive on them. Bottom line, always read and follow the caution warnings on their labels and sidewalls. Oh yeah, don't be one of those poor schmucks with a flat tire and a flat spare. Check your spare once a month. While checking the spare, look at the jack, the jack handle, and the lug wrench to be sure everything is there and in working order. The best spare tire in the world is useless without the tools to put it on the car. Some cars may even require special lug nuts to mount the spare. If those special lug nuts are missing, you will have no safe way to use your spare. Life changes at a ferocious pace these days, especially when it comes to maintaining our cars. For example, automatic transmissions now need regular fluid flushes. Transmission fluid breaks down with use, and although it may look fine, its additives wear out and it can no longer properly protect bands, clutches, seals, and other hugely expensive parts inside your transmission. Bottom line, more wear and a shorter transmission life. Now you can significantly extend transmission life with a BG transmission flush every 24 to 30,000 miles or two years. BG makes the best transmission flush machine I've ever tested. It renews all of the fluid in your transmission, not just a small part of it. The BG transmission flush machine is safe, too, because it uses the natural circulation of the transmission. Your transmission will work better and last longer. As with everything BG offers, this is a superior service. For more information, go to bgprod.com or bgfindashop.com. 
Garage. This is Goss's Garage with Pat Goss. Call the show now at 844-885-4677. That's 844-885-GOSS. And now, Pat Goss. This portion of Goss's Garage is brought to you by BG Products. Hi, in the studio, Mr. Rick Robinson from American High Performance in Wharton, Virginia. They build all the really high performance American uh, muscle cars and so on. Uh, we're talking about electrics, big change there. By the way, I have a business venture for you. I have a new design. I think it's going to be a true winner. We're going to make a lot of money on it. I am designing long tube headers for electric motors <laughs> to get rid of the used electrons. Uh, yeah, what do you do with all those things? You know, once they go through the motor, you got to exhaust them somewhere, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> See, uh, we're on to something here. It could be a really big issue. Uh, that's right. Uh, and again, one of those sea changes for uh, the industry is that uh, that stuff's going to go away eventually. Oh. And now, you know, we're still working on 60s uh, muscle cars today, so it's not like we're going to throw all of these... Uh, uh, great cars that we uh, that we're putting out today away, you know, in the next 10, uh, 10 years, unless the EPA has their way. And everybody out there, go online and and send the the RPM Act to your congressman and get that passed. Um, why is it? And I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but why is it every couple years, some bill, someplace, either nationally or uh, California is a good one for it, where they want to scrap every car beyond a, a certain age. And they've, they've done that in California uh, a couple of times. Yeah. I mean, right here in Virginia, they're, they're trying to uh, do it quietly. Um, we work on a lot of the Fox Body Mustangs. I mean, that was the performance car of its day and, and still is a great car. If you go to the drag strip, you'll see dozens of them out there because they're fast little cars. Um, and, uh, and we've built some uh, great ones that are, you know, 600 horsepower. And I would, uh, I would challenge you to uh, say that it's uh, less emissions compliant than it was back in 1990 when it was built. Um, but the, uh, the Virginia EPA has been gradually increasing the... Uh, uh, emission requirements on those cars, lowering the level uh, little by little every year uh, to essentially drive those cars off the road. Yeah, and, and the fact of the matter is when you look at the total vehicle population, they are such a small percentage that even if they were horrible polluters, it really doesn't make that much difference. Right. I mean, this this ill-founded uh, rule that uh, the EPA put in uh, what was actually uh, a, a piece of truck um, uh, policy that they, uh, they put out and they slipped this in there uh, was to say that you could not take a production uh, car and turn it into a race car. That's insanity. I mean, who would think of that? These green nuts that we've got out there that, uh, that think uh, that these cars, because we change them, when we modify them, are now these huge polluters. They are such a small percentage of what's out on the road today that it has absolutely nothing to do with our uh, pollution problems. All right. Um, Joel has a uh, Chevy Cavalier. It's got long crank times. And he says, I did the spark tester check many times. This time the spark was yellow-orange. Well, we know it's not going to start with a yellow-orange uh, spark. Uh, while having a long crank time, engine tried to start, still no white spark. Spark turned white, then the car started, all right? So we know what our problem is. We don't know what's causing our problem. Since I changed the ignition coils with Delphi parts a few months ago, do you think the ignition control module is failing? Not until today, I couldn't see the spark as being yellow-orange. Did it in the early morning where it was still somewhat dark outside. So he's been fighting this thing. He's put uh, crank sensor, uh, coils, you name it, plugs, uh, 
and he still has this long crank time. And I had told him that one of the things he should be doing here is checking the input from the ignition switch because we find quite a few ignition switches that are bad and uh, it drops the voltage to the ignition system and it may do it intermittently and you wind up with a no start or long crank times and things like that. Would you care to add anything to that? Well, just like with the electric cars, it's all about voltage, right? You've got to get the right voltage to uh, mm -hmm. the coils, otherwise they're not going to generate the spark that they need to, uh, to fire the motor. Um, and, and it'll probably misfire at high RPMs, too, because you might have even higher demand on the uh, spark plug at uh, high RPMs. Um, yeah, go back to basics. You know, look at the wiring. I, my, I was just telling you earlier that my daughter brought me her Jeep Cherokee, and one of the problems she had was uh, she'd, she'd come out to start the thing up and go, and it, and it wouldn't start. It wouldn't do anything. She'd just turn the key and nothing. You know? uh, there were a few little things that would come on, and, uh, and she's had some other electrical problems with the thing, so she gives it to me, and, and I start looking for all of these complicated things like uh, he's doing, and I, and I finally said, wait a minute, stop. Go back to basics pull the uh, terminal off the battery and while it had just a little bit of corrosion building up building up around the bolt and I assume it does that because the metal is different you get a little corrosion mm -hmm. that starts around the bolt that holds the, uh, the battery terminal on when I pulled it off there was like a white film around the inside of uh, the uh, the terminal and on the uh, post of the uh, battery had my screwdriver scraped all of that uh, off or as much as I could, put it back on, and the sucker fired right up. It was not pulling enough juice through that uh, battery right. clamp to uh, to start the, uh, the the motor. You know, in in my technician classes, I walk into the classroom. I have a, a blackboard set up, and the very first thing I do is, "Hi, I'm Pat Goss," and then I write "Kiss" on the the blackboard. Keep it simple, stupid. And there's so much of this that, you know, I find myself sometimes overcomplicating things and, and so on. I omitted a step or some other lunacy. And uh, invariably, when I do something like that, uh, there was something really simple that mm -hmm. I overlooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing is check your ground. So the ground is as important as the supply end. Uh, right. You know, you, the, uh, that, that red cable on your battery is where it's getting uh, the juice from, but it's got to get back to the other side, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've got dirty grounds uh, in that initial circuit anywhere, that's going to do it, too. Absolutely. All right. Um, Rick, we're just about out of time. Tell us a little bit about American High Performance. Well, as you mentioned, we're an American muscle car, so unfortunately we don't work on any imports for you import guys out there. Um, but we, uh, we work on Mustangs, Camaros, Corvettes, Dodge, uh, Challengers, Chargers, all of the great American muscle cars from the classics up to uh, the latest. Uh, and our specialty is performance upgrades, engine, transmission, drivetrain, brakes, suspension, all the things that you need to build a true performance car. It's not just horsepower. Um, and we're located in Lorton, Virginia, right off of I-95. You can find us on the web at AmericanHighPerformance.com. Go look at our new website. It's terrific. Uh, we have a web store there as well. And uh, you can call us at 703-339-7412. And you're easy to find. Uh, we are. We are. Uh, we're, like I said, we're right on I-95 for the local folks here. Uh, but look for us on the web too, AmericanHighPerformance.com. Okay. All right, well, folks, we have about done the show one more time. Big thanks to Rick Robinson from American High Performance for joining us today. Always a pleasure to have him on the show. And, of course, want to say thanks to Steve McMillan for producing today's show. For everyone here at Goss's Garage, I'm Pat Goss. Until next time, big favor to ask of you. Please, drive gently. We'll see you.